All right, well, since it's uh, almost two minutes after the half hour, I guess I'll, I'll get started. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for, for tuning in today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jonathan Bidlack. I'm the director of the governance program at the R Street Institute. We are a think tank dedicated to promoting limited effective government and uh, more generally uh, making all levels of government work better and be more responsive. Uh, I'm also the director of our fiscal and budget policy project, which raises awareness of the importance of fiscal responsibility and uh, just ways in which uh, policymakers can accomplish their goals while respecting the nation's finances. Uh, today, we are here to talk about uh, and discuss the 35th anniversary of Steve Rhodes's classic book, The Economist's View of the World. This book is a Financial Times book of the year. Uh, and a Wall Street Journal book of the year. So uh, it, it got both. Um, but rather than me describing it to you, I, I think I'll just uh, describe a little bit of the acclaim that it's received. And, and I will say one of the things that, that I found very striking is that the praise that this book has received has come from a very diverse ideological perspective. Um, Alan Blinder of Princeton and the former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve has called it a classic. Uh, Harvard's Greg Mankiw called it thoughtful and thought provoking from beginning to end. Uh, Columbia's Andrew Gelman called it a great book, and the well-known communitarian Amitai Etzioni said it was one of the very best books he has ever read. Uh, Arthur Brooks has called it the classic primer on the theory and practice of economics, and perhaps uh, most amazing, amazingly, I would say, uh, Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman said that he loved the original uh, and, uh, and that it was his first introduction to the distinctive way economists see the world. So uh, that's quite high praise, I think, uh, uh, for, for Steve's work. So uh, to discuss the book uh, today and, and sort of the impact on economics on, of economics on policymaking and, and the public discourse more broadly, uh, I wanna start by introducing what I think is a very impressive panel. Um, First, Dr. Stephen Rhodes is Professor Emeritus in Politics at the University of Virginia. He holds his AB in History from Princeton University and a PhD in Government from Cornell. He's also a veteran of the US Navy uh, and the former Secretary of the Director's Review at the US Bureau of the Budget, uh, which is the predecessor to the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, Dr. Rhodes is also the author of the book we're here to discuss. So uh, thank, you, uh, thank you so much, Steve, for, for joining us. Uh, our second panelist is Megan McArdle. Uh, Megan is a, a columnist for the Washington Post and the author of The Upside of Down, Why Failing Well is the Key to Success. It's a very fantastic book, actually, for those of you who haven't read it, and I uh, very much recommend it, and I'll, I'll put the link in the chat in a bit. Uh, Ms. McArdle previously served as a journalist for a number of premier publications, including Bloomberg, The Atlantic, and Newsweek. Her commentary has appeared in publications ranging from the New York Post, the New York Sun, to Reason Magazine, The Guardian, and so on. You, you name it, I think she's been published there. Um, and she also began her journalism career as a writer for The Economist. So uh, thank you, Megan, for being, for being here today. Uh, and then last and certainly not least uh, is Dr. Doug uh, holtz Eakin, the founder and president of American Action Forum. Uh, in his career, Dr. holtz Eakin has been chief economist of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, where he helped formulate policies in response to the recession of 2000 and 2001, uh, as well as the economic response to the attacks on 9-11. Uh, Dr. holtz Eakin was also the sixth director of the Con uh, Congressional Budget Office, which provides budgetary and policy analysis to Congress. He later served as Director of Domestic and Economic Policy for John McCain's presidential campaign in 2008, uh, as well as was a commissioner on the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. And uh, before all of that and his involvement in public policy, he began his career as an economist at Columbia University and, and later at Syracuse. So uh, thank you, Doug, and, uh, and thank you again, everyone, for, for participating today. So uh, before we get started, a, a quick note for our viewers, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to have our panelists answer, answer them, or at least some of them as we go along. Um, feel free to make use of the Q&A function below in the chat window. And uh, with that, I guess let's dive into the conversation. So uh, Steve, I'm going to ask you the first question, which I guess is maybe the, just the obvious one, which is, you know, what is the central theme of, of this book? And, and I guess, you know, more broadly, what's the central premise of economics as you see it? And um, I guess maybe to put it another way, you know, what to you defines the economic way of thinking or, you know, what is the economist's view of the world? And uh, I guess the related question is, you know, why, why write this book and, and, and why update it 35 years later? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for setting this up, Jonathan. I, uh, I wrote it because the, the, the first one was very popular, well, well received, and a lot of people asked me to write another one. And uh, I knew I had to because although I have a lot of examples 
and anecdotes, they're all at least 35 years old. <laughs> you can't advertise the 35th anniversary without being sure that it has been read by a lot of older people, uh, the first edition. So uh, I, uh, I really look forward to it. I don't write long books well when I don't have time off. So I, was, I said, I'll wait till I retire. And fortunately, I lived another five years and I have accomplished this with uh, Cambridge University Press. And I, I wrote it because I do think this is a distinctive view of the world and a very interesting one and very important in policy circles. Uh, let me briefly mention sociology versus economics. There's a wonderful article, I can't, don't have my citation, but by Mansur Olson, he compares the two. He says, you know, sociologists say, it's great. Think people get along if they all kind of agree. You know, they have the same religion. They have the same views about a whole lot of things. It's not a bunch of communists and a bunch of Nazis. You know, how, how in the world do they ever make that work democratically? So it's good to have a lot of people agreeing on, on some fundamental things. Uh, uh, economists say, well, not necessarily. Because one of the things people agree with in France is everybody goes on vacation in August. Everybody. But that means all the restaurants are closed when everybody's going on vacation. And what about July? It's beautiful. You get cheaper rooms and everything. Well, how did this one get started? It's obviously better if you have different preferences. If you, one person likes to climb the mountain and another person likes to fish, you know, if, if they all prefer to fish, there's not enough room around the lakes. It's great if people have different preferences. So it, this is this distinctive economic way of thinking is very important. And I think it's, uh, it's well, I'll stop there. Well, let me, let me ask you a, a follow-up question to that, which is something that I've actually been wondering and that, that we haven't talked about, which is that, you know, in the original version of your book, the 1985 edition, um, the title of the book was actually slightly different than what it is this time around. So that title was The, the Economist's View of the World, Government Markets and Public Policy. Um, but this edition, the subtitle is And the Quest for Well-Being. And so uh, I, I was wondering, you know, what that change reflects in your eyes. You know, is it... Uh, do you think that the, the field of economics has sort of um, changed over time or over, over the decades in which the two versions were written? Or is this a, a marketing decision or was there something at play? Why, why the increased emphasis on, on well-being specifically? Well, another great question. Uh, it's somewhat marketing. My editor said, oh, that's not gonna work. This time we're gonna try to make it a trade book. And they can see it's about markets and government and and by looking at the, at the index, you know, that, that doesn't tell them anything they don't know. We need something that catches the eye of, of the general reader. And that's no question about it. I make it clear in the beginning that I want to attract people who don't like economics or don't know anything about it. Uh, you know, a lot of people take one economics course. Maybe their dad said, you got to take one economics course. And uh, they didn't like it. And that's the end of it. But if they know that I know you're, what you're thinking, you don't think you're going to like this book. And I think I can write pretty well and people are going to like it, even if they don't want, know much economics. It's written for you. No graphs, no, no math. Um, so I think that's one of the big reasons why. And, and the other thing is it pays attention to the critique, which is important. I mean, I, I, I have two cheers for economics, one boo. And the boo is pretty straightforward and, 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 and said in a forceful way, I think. You know, this isn't the end of the world. This is not the way most people think. Uh, it's too self-interested. And it doesn't go along with contemporary uh, research in other fields. Uh, for example, there's virtue ethics in, in philosophy. I grew up in the last 35 years. Lots of interest in Aristotle and Adam Smith. There's positive psychology in the last 35 years. Big, big interest in that. And they are absolutely against thinking you're going to be happy if, if you use self-interest, which is what economists tend to say makes the world go around. And uh, I, I point out things like people who volunteer are trying to help other people, and they get helped every bit as much as the people they're trying to help. They love it. I mean, wouldn't you think it's kind of neat to, to knock on 16 doors with a hot meal of people who for the most part, haven't seen anybody all week. Do you think they're gonna have a big smile to see you? 
it's not all that bad to have knock on doors, have, have big smiles greet you. And uh, so they say, the volunteers say, I was hooked. I got to know these people. They needed me and I needed them. So I, I, I think we're focusing on the critique. I, I say that up front by saying, and the quest for well being, because that doesn't all come from economics. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I think these are really, really fantastic points. And I, and I like the distinction between sociology and economics. I think that, um, you know, economics doesn't necessarily say a whole lot about why people hold the preferences that they do, but it gives you a framework or a way to sort of um, have society operate in a way that satisfies those preferences, whatever, whatever they may be. And there's plenty of room, I think, to, um, you know, to talk about other, uh, what preferences should be. But oftentimes economics doesn't have as much to, to say about that. Um, mm -hmm. Megan, I wanna, um, I wanna bring you a little bit into the conversation here and, and maybe just have you give us a bit of a personal perspective and, and describe for us how, you know, your own personal evolution, you obviously write a lot about economic topics and I think uh, your, your writing reflects the, um, the, econ the economist view of the world. And so uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how your own views have, have developed, how you, how you got to where you are uh, intellectually today. Uh, yeah, mine was a slow evolution. I was the classic kid whose father wanted them to take one economics class. <laughs> I was an English major and my parents wished me to do something more practical. Um, and so my father sneakily not only asked me to take an economics class, um, but got me a subscription to The Economist. Um, so I actually graduated with a minor in economics. Um, you know, I think it was four or six courses I had to take and I found those interesting. Um, but then I got out into the world, I worked for some startups, um, and then I went to business school because I didn't, I got to the age of 26, realized I didn't want to do what I was doing and had no idea what I did want to do other than be a novelist, which was not really a practical ambition. And so I went to the University of Chicago and just got completely hooked by what is the, this is the, the kind of, it's the fentanyl of economics, right? It's the like, the pure distilled, <laughs> um, and I, I fell in love with economics there. That was where I really started to love the way of thinking. And I think, um, you know, I think thinking about what is the, the way that an economist thinks, I think of it as David Graeber, the, uh, the late anthropologist who wrote this huge book on debt, um, describes a kind of divide between in, in um, you know, hunter-gatherer societies between market exchange, which is what you do with strangers, and then the kind of gift economy that you do with your family. So when I go to the grocery store, my mother needs something. I don't then present her with an itemized bill. Maybe some families do that. I'm just like, you'll get me back sometime, right? That's gift, that's gift exchange. And that's how actually most people are when they're not dealing with strangers. How most, you know, kind of historical tribes would have lived is most people would be in the gift economy most of the time. Um, but then there's this other thing that you do with strangers and can be done even without language. Famously, along the African coastline, they developed... Um, a method of trading with each other where you would put stuff in piles, people would put the stuff they wanted to trade next to your piles and you would, you would um, it might take days, but eventually even without being able to speak, you could come up with the, the way to truck barter and exchange. And I think that for a modern, right, the, the reason that economics is so influential is that as the modern economy grows, it gets more complex. We're doing more and more with strangers. And if you think about how amazing it is that I, all of the time I get on the internet and I'm like, I would like to send some money to someone I've never met. And then they'll send me some stuff. And I'm completely confident that the stuff will arrive even though they're never gonna see me again. And in some cases, I'm never gonna deal with them again, right? I'm buying something one off and will never an Etsy seller. Um, that the more that that's happened, the more it's useful. And I think that I have just been fascinated by all of the ways that people find ultimately what economics is about is the ways that we find to cooperate with perfect strangers, which is really hard and not what we're evolved to do. Um, and I love, I, I will, it's just endlessly fascinating to me in a way that I did not suspect as a young English major it eventually would be. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a very eloquent description. I think that's, I think that's spot on. Um, Doug, I want to bring you in and maybe ask you a similar question, and maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about your sort of personal relationship with the field of economics. You uh, have a very uh, impressive and I think wide variety of experiences, and so I'm I'm curious as to how you got interested and and you know maybe uh, how you see your own sort of personal um, intellectual evolution over time. Well, I I um, ended up as an economist because my uh, undergraduate advisor looked at me in the fall of my senior year and said, "You're not ready to have a job. You better go to graduate school." And so I was a 
an, um, a math and economics double major. I applied graduate programs in math. They correctly figured out I was a computer scientist in disguise. So I got into none of those. I applied to a bunch of uh, economics programs and I got into a couple with some partial aid. And then very late in the game, Princeton accepted me, gave me a full ride and, and a stipend. And so they paid me to go to graduate school. And I thought, okay, why not? And it was there that I actually first just completely struggled. I was unprepared for the graduate level of uh, presentation. And so I, 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 I flunked everything in sight. Now, the good news in that era in Princeton, you could drop a class on the day of the final. So I have no classes on my transcript. Um, I dropped all of them and instead just managed to get myself prepped up to pass the, the field exams, micro, macro, econometrics, three fields of uh, concentration. I did money, monetary theory, economic history, and public finance. And, and once I got past the first year classwork, I really started doing the research. I worked for lots of different people, including the, the Alan Binder, who you noted at the outset, Steve Goldfeld, Richard Quant, Harvey Rosen. Um, and I, I learned how they all did economics and it was all different. And I, I like Megan, fell in love with it. I just thought this is fantastic. And um, I had sort of a couple of, of key pieces of, of evolution along the way. One is after I'd been at Columbia for about three years, had a complete crisis of, of faith. I, I was teaching classes to undergraduates who appeared to be busily organizing their social lives in front of me. And I was writing these papers that got published in journals no one reads, let's face it. And so I thought, is, does, does this have any value? And so I, I decided to, to leave it. And I went to Washington and worked at the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, and while I was there, I, I learned two very important things. Uh, number one, I learned that that large amount of research that's out there done by economists and others really is the only check on the policy process. I mean, people can and will say anything to get their preferred outcome. You know, if we just cut the capital gains rate, there will be no more teenage pregnancy. I promise you, no. Um, and so you just get go get the research and say, that can't happen. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but that can't. That was a huge, really a big moment for me. It gave me faith in the entire enterprise as a, as a career. And the second thing I did is I sat in all these interagency meetings and I realized I was just teaching them economics. I mean, they were campaign strategists or lawyers or, you know, all sorts of things. And, and, and I'd be like, okay, we don't need to worry about that. Private incentives are going to take care of that. This, this little uh, disguised piece of communist party planning should just end. We just, this meeting can stop now. We don't need to do this. That was in a Republican administration. And so the, the, the second thing that happened to me there was I went from being a guy who as an academic was a public finance economist coming up with clever solutions for market failures to a guy who was like walking free to choose, like, don't touch that. Um, it's, it's all fine. Relax. <laughs> we have good incentives. It'll be, it'll be okay. And, and that, so that was a really uh, crucial moment in sort of my thinking about the importance of economics and public policymaking, uh, the importance of magnitudes. I've, I've done a lot of work on uh, this empirical nature for that reason, magnitudes matter, um, but also just economics is a decision-making science. And then the second one, and I, this is a long answer, I apologize. Second one is on, on Megan's. When I was at Syracuse, I invented a course called Economics in the Media, and I taught it in the Newhouse School of uh, Communications because I thought if I could get one good literate journalist, that would be better than producing 20 economics majors for life. Uh, the, um, the course was a crashing failure. The people who went to the Newhouse School went to the Newhouse School because they did not want to be around people like me, people who liked math and graphs and, and, and economics. And so uh, one of the things I learned is that you do have to figure out how to sell what you're doing. And one of the biggest things I learned about the journalism business is it was about capturing an emotion to a great extent. TV is all about emotion. And good economics is about taking the emotion out, doing the analysis. And so we were not going to meet in the middle automatically. That, that was hard work. And I've spent a lot of time since trying to make good policy, good politics by having the right emotional content, among other things. Those are, those are big moments. Yeah, that's, that's a really great story. And, uh, and I think you're, you're totally right about, about taking out the emotion, or at least I would say maybe being dispassionate is the way that yes. uh, yeah. uh, I, I would characterize. I think, it's, I think it's a great point. And I also think it's a fantastic point about uh, the need to, to, you know, I mean, maybe evangelize isn't the right word, but to, to, to market these ideas to a broader audience that otherwise might not see them, which is, of course, the purpose of Steve's book, I think, to a large degree. So, um, Steve, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go back to you here and let's let's take it back to a question about the book, which is, you know, you, the, you start off the book, uh, your first section is um, you introduce a number of 
what you call use the useful concepts of economics. And so it's things like, you know, opportunity costs, which I'm sure that, you know, most of our viewers are familiar with. But um, the second and third are, are marginalism and, and economic incentives more broadly. And I wonder if you could maybe take a few minutes to just uh, explain briefly uh, what you mean by those. Sure. Uh, I'll spend more time on marginalism because I think people are least aware of that. Economic incentives, if they've taken any environmental courses, they've no doubt encountered the economist solution, which is not uh, about making people do certain things, but giving them incentives to do certain things. And it's a hard for students to get this. You know, I go, I used to go in and I'd say, well, suppose you put uh, $10 tax on this amount of, of, of carbon and, uh, and, whoever can do it most cheaply will do it and the others will pay the tax. And then who, the students say, well, you pick, uh, you, you assume that one of them wants to pay 10 bucks. Maybe none of them want to pay 10 bucks. They all think they'd rather pollute. I said, well, then you raise the tax. If you said we're going we're to tax you 100,000 instead of 100, you're going to have a whole lot of people at your door. And that's using economic incentives. And look, all capitalisms are, are there to make money. And that's great because they make money generally by pleasing consumers. And uh, so let's let, um, let's let them do their stuff. And uh, the other th thing I'd say about marginalism is, so I mean, that's economic incentives. It's really self, <coughs> pretty self-evident, but marginalism, I don't think is. Because I often begin by saying, you know, um, there's a good argument that we should not, but what, well, first of all, everybody says you should set your priorities, right? If you're a municipality, how much, what do we have? We have programs that keep people safe. We have programs about health. We have programs about recreation, education. Let's ask the public, where do you think we should put more of, uh, of our additional money? And almost always they say safety and therefore fire and police. And it's very hard to get fire police when budgets to be cut because people say, why, why? We have a lot of crime. But economists say, yeah, but let's look at, uh, at what other ways we could deal with this. For example, we have well-trained policemen behind the desk answering phones some of the time. Couldn't we get a secretary to do that and put that policeman out doing something about solving the crime? And, and more important still, if marginalism says you got to look at each individual program because even though recreation may come in last, it may be we, we really need another basketball court because there's such demand for it. And, and that besides, that would also help crime, right? Because a lot of guys with, with a lot of energy, testosterone, they don't need that much. We'll get rid of some of them on the basketball court and, uh, and that would be good for safety as well. But uh, what that so we got to look at benefits and costs on each case. If if if, we, if you say, talk literally what the public says, safety programs first. You you get what police and fire everything they ask for, because that's the most important thing to the public. And then among the things you'd probably do would be to say we're not going to let anybody play a little league baseball on our fields anymore. And uh, what? Why? Well, it's a, it can be very unsafe. You know, the most common eye injury in all of youth sports is baseball. And sometimes people get hit in the chest and their heart stops. I mean, this is a dangerous sport. You're killing people if you subsidize it because people die. Why are we subsidizing things from coming where people die? The public says safety first. Well, people's gonna say, ah, that's not what the public meant. So once in a blue moon, Somebody dies. Look at all the people who get great pleasure from Little League Baseball. You ask the, the question wrong. You gotta say, this is what we do uh, for safety if we wanted to do something new. And this is what we do for recreation if we want to do something new. And let people look at the details. Because if you don't look at the details, you're not going to get your real benefits and costs, which are not the average benefits, but the marginal benefits. That's where marginal comes in. Anyway, uh, so I think it's a really important concept. It's one of it's the one that uh, the whole book is a guy who puts together the short encyclopedia of economics, he calls it. 
And he called me up and said, I'd like to use, use your chapter for marginalism. It's the best description I've seen. So, and he wanted to get that right. He's an economist. Uh, so I'm in there with all these famous economists talking about marginalism. I think it's that important. I try very hard to, to describe it well. John, yeah, I agree with that. that. I think, can I, can I ahead, go? Yeah. So one of the things that I find really interesting about economics and marginal thinking is that quietly it solves political problems. People don't quite appreciate this, but if everyone's operating uh, you know, and, and producing things at least cost, we know the social cost of doing something. Everyone's looking at prices and deciding how much to, to buy. We're agreeing at the margin on the value of the last unit of production. We have unanimity about what Twizzlers, my most favorite uh, commodity, my, we know what Twizzlers are worth in society. We don't have to poll. We don't have to hold a vote in the House and the Senate. We've, we've solved this problem. How many Twizzlers should we have and how much do we value them? And we can do that for an amazing number of things in a world where people have enormous differences in tastes but they are going to agree unanimously. It's a huge political victory. And we can relegate to the Congress those, those small situations where markets don't work all that well. And I think that's fantastic. It's a huge political victory if you think about it that way. And briefly, yeah. Doug, I liked your first comments too, because you say a lot of the things you say that people who don't know are economics are, this will get better on its own. We don't, need, we don't have any public there. That's what, that's what good capitalism does. Yeah. And to explain why good capitalism works very well, better than the government, that's an important part of what you do. Don't do that. Don't do that. You don't need to do that. Yeah, I think anyone who's ever worked in a council of economic advisors will tell you that um, your contribution is really killing values attracted. 90% of what you do is kill off bad ideas. And, and that, that's the job. Yeah. No, I think I think for me, I mean, personally, I think the, the concept of, uh, of thinking about marginalism was... Um, the most important takeaway that I, 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 I took from, from, you know, when I first started studying economics, right? Because to some degree, it is that core, it's really the manifestation of that, that core question about how do you trade off different preferences or different options? Um, and so it's, um, I think it's very difficult sometimes, I think people's uh, instinctive mindset is to look at, you know, to, to Steve's point, to look at the, the, the value inherent in something, right? Um, so I, I'll give you another example in my own work. When we talk about, you know, what should the federal government spend on? Well, you know, it's, it's oftentimes very difficult to get people to, on, on both sides of the aisle, to talk about the Pentagon from a sort of a dispassionate way, um, because there's this presumption that national defense is, is critically important, which I think 99.9% .9 of people agree with. And, and the vast majority of people also understand that it's a core function of the, the federal government. And so, um, but when you're talking about how much funding should the Pentagon have, um, that's only part of the question, right? It's not just, is this valuable? It's how valuable is it relative to other things and relative to the budgets for those other things? And so I think that that, um, you know, that concept comes up time and time again, you know, in the public policy sphere, but also just, of course, when we're talking about, you know, weighing preferences in a, in a household, for example, or, or in a business. And so um, I think that it's a, it's an insight that has for me anyway, I think has, I see as having a lot of value in a lot of different um, contexts, but I will say, I think it's also a very difficult one to explain. And so, you know, Megan, I want to maybe throw this to you here as someone who, who is, you know, writing about uh, and, and getting people, I think, to understand these concepts in, in, the, in, the, in the context of the broader public discourse. Um, I wonder if you can maybe tell us a little bit about how you know, how relevant are these concepts? Um, do you find that people increasingly or maybe decreasingly understand um, the concept of marginalism or opportunity costs and so on? And, and, you know, what, for those of us who are, I think, passionate about these ideas, are there things that you think that we can do to maybe convey the, the economist's perspective a, a little bit more effectively in our own, you know, writing and sort of, uh, you know, education and advocacy work? Well, you know, I'm trying every day. Uh, I don't always say the <laughs> words because the jargon alienates people, but I think that you can describe them without using these concepts, even though I think the marginal revolution in economics is probably the most powerful intellectual uh, revolution of the, the 19th century. Um, so I would say uh, it, is, it is often difficult. People resist understanding these things, partly because it means they can't do so what they want, right? So, um, but I mean, I'll give you a couple examples of where I have tried to explain these things, not always successfully. So for example, when the Grenfell Tower happen, fire happened in London, 
and everyone rushed to say, well, you know, the, the landlord didn't spend enough money on, um, on fireproofing, on, on putting spr basically retrofitting sprinklers into the building, which is a good thing to do. Um, but I pointed out the landlord is the government. It was, a, it was council housing is what it's known as in the UK. And that the government had other things it could also spend on that helped people. And you don't know that this was, I mean, it was a tragic accident. And of course, in hindsight, you know that you would like them to have put sprinklers in, but that doesn't mean that you know that, you know, that there might have been some other thing they did with the money that actually saved more lives than this. You have to think about what the opportunity cost is. Um, this was incredibly unpopular. Also, it turned out later after investigation that the main problem was that they had used a very, very flammable fire cl uh, and like cladding on the building that they shouldn't have used. And that that was a case where I don't think the marginal in any way, the opportunity cost justified what happened. Um, but at the time, it, you know, it is important to always think about what is, what are we, what's the alternative that we could have done with this money? It's not free. There's no money tree in the backyard. Um, another area where I've often and have actually tried to explain marginal cost to people um, is in things both Netflix and in Medicare and Medicaid hospital uh, reimbursements. So um, the reason that, the, uh, so why do, why do these two things go together? So hospital reimbursements is, is a case where everyone looks at the fact that Medicare and Medicaid pay less for various treatments than the private sector does. And they think, ah, all we need to do to wring costs out of the healthcare system is to make everyone pay what Medicare or Medicaid pays. This is a system known as all payer. Um, and the problem is that those payments don't actually cover the full cost of running the hospital. Now, it can still be profitable if, well, your private patients are paying for your mortgage and your air conditioning and all that stuff. It can be, it can make sense, economic sense for the hospital to add extra patients that only need to cover, say, the cost of their nursing care and changing the sheets or whatever those variable costs are. Right, but that doesn't mean that everyone can get that pricing. If everyone gets is 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 paying below the average cost of rent of these fixed costs, then the hospital will go bankrupt. Um, and that's something that people don't really want to know because it seems like such an easy solution when you see it. Um, and the concept that I try to explain is everyone can't be the marginal cost consumer, right? Everyone, someone has to cover the fixed costs. And similarly with Netflix, right? So people would ask, why was it that Netflix? Um, you know, everyone wanted to uh, get this incredibly cheap. I'm really sorry about this. I, sleeping dogs did not lie. And uh, my dog keeps pawing it. So she, she it goes into the frame. We've exhausted the peanut butter Kong I just gave her. So she may just come up and say hi. Um, so she was asleep when we started looking very peaceful. It was a mistake. I should have put her in her crate. Um, anyway, so with Netflix, if, you were, if people remember uh, 10 years ago, Netflix switched had just launched streaming and people were very excited about it. And everyone said, I'm just going to cut cable and I'm just going to pay, you know, $5.99 a month. And I don't understand why everyone can't do that. And well, the answer was Netflix had basically gotten a special deal from Stars, the cable provider to run all of their library of movies because it was marginal revenue. It wasn't really cannibalizing any Stars viewers at that point. And it was just gravy for Stars to take this, this thing they'd already paid for, the digital rights and, and lease it on to Netflix. But then as more and more people are getting Netflix and canceling their cable, that's no longer a viable business model because someone still has to pay for those movie rights. And indeed, Stars canceled the deal and that forced Netflix to raise its prices and everyone got very upset. Um, and again, everyone can't be the marginal cost customer. Someone has to pay the fixed costs. And so, you know, it, I think it's really valuable actually to always think about when you're getting really good deals and you would like everyone to get that same deal. Are you getting that good deal because you're an average cost because you're a marginal cost customer because all you're paying is some like pills or another pharmaceuticals is a third example of this where like all of the cost in, in drugs is basically in the billions of dollars you spend developing the drug and then it's really cheap to manufacture the additional drug. But if you want new drugs, someone's got to pay those billions. So uh, over and over again, this marginal cost. Uh, thinking on the margin just comes up for me all the time. And I spend a lot of time trying to explain it to people, but people, it isn't a natural way to think. And people don't like thinking that way because it often means that something that had looked like it was going to be a free, easy way to do something isn't actually going to work. And so you get a lot of pushback whether or not you use the chart. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I think that's I think that's right, and I think the um, I think the examples are all really good ones. I think it's um, one of the ways that it can be helpful to explain these concepts is by having these 
these specific yeah. examples in mind. I think the prescription drug example is a really a really good one that I use all the time in, in policy work. Um, Doug, maybe just uh, to close out the section, if you want to uh, maybe share any more on your end about how this concept maybe has informed some of your work. Um, you know, I mean, the Congressional Budget Office, right, is providing estimates of what the, the new spending or the new revenue implications are of legislation. So in a sense, I mean, you're basically operationalizing this concept um, in, the, in the context of, of work with Congress. So, um, you know, I, but it's, it seems to me that uh, in much the same way that, that Megan just described that many people don't want to necessarily think about this concept um, in those examples, sometimes legislators perhaps don't want to go and, uh, and, and think about it in the context of, of new legislation either. Um, so what the CBO does is it, uh, quote, scores legislation, which is to, to calculate the change in revenue coming into the Treasury and the change in spending going out of the Treasury as a result of en enacting a proposed piece of legislation. That's just the marginal federal budget cost. It's just a marginal concept. And, and that's what the CBO does again and again and again in a very disciplined fashion. Um, it, it's frustrating to Congress because it set up the CBO to calculate federal budget costs. And it doesn't do two things that Congress would very much like it to do. Uh, number one, uh, calculate the benefits. Well, that's actually not the CBO's job. That's the Congress's job. Is this worth it? We will give you the, the, the marginal cost of all these different activities. You can compare one to another, but only you know the marginal benefits relative to one another. So go figure out what you wanna do. But they very much like the CBO to say, do that, even though they are precluded by, by law from doing so. That's in the statute. Second thing is they don't actually calculate the economic cost. They're there to do federal budget work. And so they don't answer the, the social question, should we as a society be in this business and should we have more or less, whether it's police and fire or whatever it may be, um, that, that's not the job they're asked to do either. So um, I, I, I loved working with the CBO. There, there's an enormous range of, of topics to go through, but in the end, it, it's always the same economic framework that's being applied. And, and to me, you know, um, as I matured as an economist, I, I stopped thinking about economics being right, right? I, you know, as a, as a young person, I'd be like, well, economics is right, and political science is not, sociologists is not, those people, God, wasted careers, terrible thing. Uh, that, that's not a good way to look at it. Um, as I told my dean one time, um, I'm an economist because I find it to be a relatively useful way to organize my thinking about the universe. And it has been helpful to me in, in getting insights into how the world works. I'm not a political scientist because I think it's a relatively useless way to, to look at the world. He was a political scientist. I don't think we got the extra position I was asking for, but that's life. Um, uh, but that's, 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 what, that's what you do with economics. You organize your thinking so that you can not only follow the same steps all the time. That's crucial, but it allows you to apply the same kinds of reasoning in very different situations. You don't have to think different things when you're talking about healthcare and when you're talking about the, the Pentagon budget. You're thinking in the same way, and that's really valuable. No, it's a great point. And I, I had a similar experience as an undergrad in that, uh, you know, when I was debating between majors uh, and, and I, uh, you know, asked an academic advisor and what he said to me was, you know, look, to some degree, it doesn't really matter what you what you do, right? What matters is that you get a framework for helping to, as you said, organize your thoughts. And, and you know, you obviously have to be open minded and, and understand the limitations of that framework, but that that's kind of what you're what you're there to do. And, and economics, I think, is, uh, is, you know, one of the uh, most important frameworks, even if it's not always right or not, not all encompassing. Um, and, and, and maybe to that to that point, uh, Steve, I want to go back to you again, back to the book, because um, you know, chapter five in your book, you talk about, um, you know, economists and equity. And I thought that was an interesting topic because, uh, or at least an interesting title, because, you know, economists are typically thought of as not being concerned about, about equity, right? We're, we're more thinking about efficiencies or maximizing utility and, and things of this nature. And so um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about that chapter in, in particular and, and what you think uh, you know, economics and, and economists have to say about the topic of equity specifically. Yes, I'd like to. Uh, I think economists get a bad rap because people think they don't pay any attention to equity and they say they do. And, uh, and equity for an economist, it seems, it seems a little off to me. I'll explain why at the end, but equity means are the poor getting enough, essentially, if it's rich and poor in the middle class? I mean, there's been a trend for the top percentiles to get more than in the past and, and for other percentiles to, to get less. 
at least that's what most of the statistics say. Now, there's a one thing I, I found in this, it's very hard to write this chapter. It's long, but it's not, it's not long because it's really important because the problem is economists don't agree. I've been trying to get my readers to say, boy, economists, everybody says, you know, with, with Harry Truman, I keep hearing on the one hand this, on the one hand that from my economists. I want to get me a one-handed economist. This, this is ridiculous. What should I do? And uh, so economists agree much more than people think, but on equity, they don't agree. Uh, they, they think that, uh, well, they tell, I think the median economist probably thinks the rich are getting too much right now. Um, there's a, a, a center uh, uh, at Harvard, what's his name? You mentioned it in my, in, uh, oh, um, anyway, you mentioned at the beginning of, of my, that he praised, yeah, he's the guy who said, uh, Greg Mankiw, maybe, if we're talking Harvard? Yeah, Mankiw. Mankiw. He has a terrific, I think it's terrific, because I think he begins to get at a very important question. That is, what about dessert? I mean, what, what, I mean, these people who are rich, I think in a way it's a little strange how we feel about them, because it used to be they're the captains of industry. You know, thank God for them. On the other hand, we didn't really have any idea what, whether they made that, but we needed to get that much money. What do they do anyway? What's the vice president at Ford do? Why does he deserve all that money? On the other hand, we know what, uh, what people at Amazon, what the leaders of Amazon do. We, we buy their products and we think they're great. So we tend to think, well, I guess they deserve all that money. They certainly have some, something that every one of the workmen who comes to my place to fix something has, has in a smartphone. And uh, Bill Gates and even the, the uh, author of, uh, uh, oh boy, I'm now showing my uh, lack of strength in, in uh, contemporary culture. But anyway, it's, what's the biggest series of, of, of uh, books that come out in the last 20 years? Harry Potter would be what I would say. Pardon? Harry Potter is what Harry I would Potter, say. Harry Potter, that's what I was thinking of. You know, the author of Harry Potter, we know what she does. And you can say, well, there's a lot of other books about the same kind of thing, but so what? Consumer sovereignty, that people want this one. So maybe she deserves all that. It takes a lot of time to write all those books. Well, it doesn't seem to make take much time for her. She's just very talented. But anyway, so the problem is um, people disagree. If people disagree, then they can't say economists think this. You have to begin to say what people thought they were gonna hear all along. Conservative economists say this. Liberal economists say this. What's different is Mankiw has a different framework. He does. He brings in dessert. Who deserves what? And he said, look, I made this money legally, as far as we know. If he didn't, bring him to court. But he made it all. He didn't cheat. Maybe he did cheat. If you think of any trust issue, resolve that. But we do seem to have Amazon, they get too much power, too much power. At the same time, you know, the, at Georgetown, they did a survey of various institutions, the military, the church, uh, the bureaucracy. Uh, you know, which, which do you have least faith in? Which do you have the most faith in? The least, least faith was, was in Congress. Now, Congress has all these ambitions for industrial policy. We're going to remake this, we're going to remake that. Yes, the public, it's the weakest institution in our country, the Congress. So you begin to say, why, are we, why do we say they should do all these things? Uh, but the most, the ones who are very popular are, are the guys who start Microsoft, the guys who start Amazon. And uh, now we even have one of the, one of the breaking with the ranks and uh, at the guy who shoots the, shoots the uh, rockets up and he's, he's now on the board of one of the uh, platforms, right? He's gonna change things and boy, people are gonna cheer that on. Maybe they'll have a different idea about big, big, uh, big, companies than they used to. Anyway, uh, so, what, what, so I say most people say, and it's pretty, uh, those on the left pretty much say, um, some of them say, how much can we get from these rich guys and still they work hard and we don't lose money because if we, if we take too much from them, they'll stop working and then we lose a lot of money, uh, tax revenue. So they say, Let, let's uh, tax them, tax them, tax them until they start to work a lot less and retire earlier and then we will have to cut back. 
but we're not there yet. They kind of think they figured out at what point we get the least amount of the most amount of money from the rich, and it's well above what they pay, 78%, something like that. It seems to me that we ought to also say, and here I go to the founders and say, what about property rights? It's in the Constitution. It, uh, if someone owns property and they invest it, and they invest it, not somebody else, and they guess right, and somebody else guesses wrong, they, they deserve more money. And uh, I mean, it, I think the idea that we should, it's perfectly all right to tax 70% of it away. Why? That's not what the founders would have said. So what's the matter with what the founders said? They say the secret of a good economy is uh, keeping incentives right. And, uh, but it is true. Here, I'll stop with this. I looked into what, how much the distribution of wealth was like in the colonial times. And it was more equal than it is now. So that makes you think, well, maybe they would have felt differently if they'd been around now. Uh, I don't think dramatically diff difficulty, differently, but it does suggest that we really do have a lot of, in, in, of uh, inequality in the distribution, but it's a lot less than the media thinks it is. I'll also say that. Uh, mm -hmm. They tend to exaggerate the differences and um, anyway, I'm gonna stop there. It's just, I don't have any teaching here there's nothing to say. Economists believe this on equity. They just, there's no consensus. I think uh, I'll add one point to that, which is that, um, and this is maybe a little bit outside of the scope, uh, so maybe a follow-up event, but I think, uh, I do think there's a difference uh, depending on the type of marketplace that you're talking about too, right? I mean, to the degree that we have superstar markets, for example, where, you know, one person or a small number of people are able to dominate in a way because of the fact that we have such strong preferences for the best of the best, I think that oftentimes people's attitudes toward uh, people who are successful in those kind of contexts are fundamentally different than than people who are successful in a more, you know, um, I don't know, traditionally competitive or sort of textbook competitive environment. And so it is interesting to maybe think about, um, you know, how conceptions of equity uh, among uh, the broader population differ depending on, mm -hmm. on that context. But um, I wonder, Doug, if you have a response to, to Steve's comments and, uh, and just kind of your thoughts about the the role or, or what uh, economists have to say about the concept of equity? Well, I think there, there really are uh, sort of two, two big camps and, and Steve identified them perfectly. One is, is a sort of um, natural rights process view of, of the universe that says, you know, this is a uh, private property. Uh, people are pursuing their economic freedoms. They're getting the rewards to it and it should be taken from them judiciously by the fiat, uh, Power of the government because they we, we have to agree as a society to have a limited government that doesn't just take things that's that's not who we are and, and so that that camps out there it's not often articulated very well and, and that has nothing to do with the magnitudes of the tax rate it has to do with the idea that there should be a lot of restraint in the actual deploying of taxing power and and what you spend the money on then then there's a a large other group that really is not worried about that that feels that it's been established that that there's a uh, a state government, a local government, a federal government, and that they're going to use the power of taxation to collect revenues. And they are essentially technocrats in the pursuit of their view of fairness, right? They can, they can say, I, I think the poor don't have enough. I can get, tell you the most efficient way to redistribute income toward the poor or redistribute wealth toward the poor or redistribute um, uh, consumption toward the poor. But the, the reason you know this is not the same as the rest of economics, this is the exercise of personal opinion, is that they can't tell you the right amount of inequality. And if they knew the right amount of inequality, then it would be a scientific question, but it's not. It's just a matter of personal taste. And, and uh, people need to be more honest about that when cloaking their, their arguments in, in, this, in this fairness of, of debate. Megan, I was going to ask you a little bit about, um, well, first of all, your views on this, but also the, the maybe the respect of the, the field of economics. Uh, although we got a, a question that came in that is perhaps a little bit tongue in cheek, which is uh, I'll, I will also raise in this context because it's just too good not to ask, which is, uh, you know, if economists all disagree, then what's the marginal value of economics? And so uh, I do think that uh, that does get to this question about respect for the field of economics. And, and uh, so, I'll, you know, I'll ask you that maybe, in, you know, if you could uh, answer that uh, maybe broadly, but also specifically in the area of journalism or people who, who um, you know, who, who uh, write about these topics. 
Well, look, I think there's there's always in journalism the temptation to do a choose your own economist where you know the kind of, you know, there's a normative and a positive aspect to this. And economists agree actually on a lot of stuff. What they don't agree about is what we should want, right? So if, if the question is how best to get something, you'll actually find often surprising amounts of agreement. If we, if we agree about the level of inequality, then there's actually a much smaller debate about how to get to that level of inequality, right? There are bad ways like, just destroying a bunch of wealth owned by rich people and not giving anything to the poor people, just making the rich less rich. That makes us less unequal, but most, I think basically all economists with maybe a few exceptions um, would agree that that's a bad way. I mean, I think there is the kind of Piketty <laughs> school of, of inequality that actually thinks that destroying fortunes would be a good thing in its own right, even if no one else gets anything out of it. Um, but in general, most economists would agree you shouldn't do that. But on the other hand, they can't tell you what the level of, of inequality is. Um, they do agree about things like, for example, rent control. Ask almost any economist. They all agree rent control is bad because it has, it doesn't solve the problem. You know, people may have different views about how much is it society's responsibility to make sure that poor people have housing? What's the quality of housing that they should have, et cetera? That's stuff that people disagree about. But what does everyone agree about? That if you slap price controls on something, you get less of that thing and the quality declines. Right. And, and so, um, you know, I think that people over perceive confusion in part because in the same way that, you know, I don't write a lot of columns saying murder is bad because we all agree murder is bad. We're not having a live debate about it. I write about the stuff that society is debating. And so in the same way that I don't write a lot of columns saying murder is bad, I don't write a lot of columns saying communism, not such a great way to organize the economy. Now, a hundred years ago, I'd probably be writing a lot of those columns, but like basically everyone except a few crazy people agrees that we've run that experiment now multiple times and it always ends the same way with a lot of people dying and the rest of them living in misery under totalitarian regimes. And that's bad and we don't like it. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think that there are areas where the areas of disagreement are areas, first of all, where people actually generally agree on the goal, but they can't figure out how to get there, right? So macroeconomics is a good example of if you followed like the stimulus debate. Now, the stimulus debate often in 2008, uh, and again, during the pandemic, it became a cover for other stuff, right? I have a, I want redistribution and therefore I'm gonna smuggle that in under the guise of stimulating the economy. Um, but everyone basically agreed that they would like output be, to be high. Again, a few crackpot environmentalists inside. Everyone agrees that unemployment is bad, higher output is good, all of those things. We just, like, we have actual, we have two kinds of disagreement. As I say, one is a technical disagreement, which is that no one really actually knows very well how this stuff works. We all have theories, but they're not well proven. The empirical evidence is hard to come by. But then there's the other thing where like, I wish to do something, I know that most people don't agree with me, so I'm going to pretend that the thing that I want to do is actually the thing we all agree on. Um, and there's a huge amount of that in economics because there's always the temptation of if you just, if you just shade. First of all, people convince themselves, as Richard Feynman said uh, long ago, the easiest person to fool is you. Uh, good salesmen always believe in their own product. But then also, some people they kind of know that what they're saying is not right. You see a lot of this from kind of aggressive supply siders on tax cuts, where at some level they have to know that just randomly cutting taxes is not gonna raise revenue. But claiming that is a lot more fun than claiming that like, I'm gonna lower taxes and then there'll be less money to spend on stuff people like. And you've seen this on the left now where the modern monetary theory, people came out and basically said the government can borrow any and spend any amount of money and it's fine and nothing, nothing bad happens, right? Um, and when you kind of try to press this, it, it appeared to me that they were having some sort of Gnostic experience I was not able to access where I couldn't really figure out what the theory was. But they, they seemed to believe it and they convinced a bunch of Democrats to, to act that way. And that is one reason I think that we're experiencing inflation is that Democrats had kind of bought in, some Democrats on the margin had bought into the crackpot theory that like it actually didn't matter how much money the US government borrowed and pumped into the economy. Um, but I think fundamentally, if you actually then drill down, there's so many areas of agreement about what it's mostly in microeconomics, not macro, but there's so many areas of, of agreement about what's going to happen if you do something. It's just that like, because often those things are common sense or because we've run that experiment as with communism, we just don't have to argue about them. And so it makes it seem like economists don't actually agree on anything or know anything. 
Yeah, it's a great. So the question, what's the, the value of a condo? Said the margin zero. But that's, <laughs> that's marginal versus average. But the average value yeah, is so high. so high. Because <laughs> we have all these things we agree on and you only get to zero if you push economics to answer questions it's not well suited to answer. No, it's a fantastic, a fantastic point and a fantastic illustration of the concepts we've been discussing. Um, we have about five minutes left, so maybe I'll uh, make this into a, a bit of a round robin. Um, Steve, you know, you um, in, in Martin Wolf, uh, Financial Times, in his acclaim for your book, uh, one of the one of his comments was that you reveal both the truths and the limitations of the discipline. And I know we touched on this at the very beginning, but um, I think it would be good for us to have a bit of a, a quick conversation about, uh, Steve, what you see those limitations as being, and, and you know, maybe uh, Doug and Megan, you can chime in about, you know, where those limitations manifest themselves, both in the public policy context, but also this, this broader, uh, you know, public discourse. Yeah, I've, thank you for bringing that up. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think, first of all, common sense of things like good character matters. Uh, people say, what's, what's good character? What, what's good character? Well, well, I don't know. Let's go back and see what, what Aristotle said. And what do you know? Adam Smith agreed. And uh, a mill agreed. Wow. Maybe we should think more about it. Maybe it's not as much, maybe some crazy guy. I mean, Ma Megan doesn't mind saying some, some opinions are crazy. Maybe the idea that you, that you can't tell the difference between good character and bad character or different ways of life. I mean, I argue that a lot of things that are good for society and good for individuals require learning, which can be hard. And, um, but nobody ever says, you know, I wish I knew more about mud, mud wrestling, you know? I think I could come to like it, but I just don't know what's going on there. Nobody said, no, I, don't, I, think, I, I think I can see what's going on there and I don't like it. I don't think it's good for society. Um, so I think that uh, these hypotheticals that uh, I think what I try to show is that it's, the, certainly this is what Adam Smith shows. It's good. And a lot of these great economists like Marshall, they say it's the people who you're trying to bring up who are the most sure that you, they're going in the right direction. I don't know whether he's right, but it's certainly true that, the, uh, that economics of 150 years ago is so different than it is now. I mean, people don't like economists. They seem so cocky. Everybody goes to them. Where's our Nobel? The sociologists say, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it's... It's um, hard, but I think I, I don't think very I, I don't think very often I say this is, I think is good and the public doesn't. I think I, I, I think I can first of all case taste change. Obviously that that uh, that uh, country song that I like so much. And I'm down here. On, he begins talking to God. I'm down here on my knees. This is the last place left to, left to fall. I want, I want you on my side. I want my, my girlfriend on my side. I want, I want the mirror to like what it sees. And this suggests that people know they're, they're not living a good life most of the time. They, they don't say, oh, I, I like liquor, I drink it. That's not what they say. They say, I, yeah, I ruined my family. It's true. And I, I love that family. And it's a big mistake. You know, I, don't, I think people don't have the same preferences when they think about what's good for me and what's not. And uh, I love what virtue ethics are doing and what uh, and all the stuff of Jonathan Haidt and so on. He talks about uh, the importance of excellence and the importance about uh, good character and awe. Who talks about awe? Well, what do you mean awe? Beautiful mountains, aren't they? Yeah, I think almost everybody likes those. But what about beautiful character? Well, what's that? You know, I go back and talk about a high school friend. You know? I mean, grade school friend, Johnny Clement. Everybody agreed that he should decide who's out, who's out and who's safe. So uh, I think there'd be more agreement on these things than people assume when they talk about values or one thing and facts or another. Doug, what do you, what do you think about the, the limitations of economics or, or and maybe in the policy making context? I, I think the the big limitation that we're facing right now is 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 not one that's a sort of a structural one in the in the way economists operate. It's 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 in how we've presented ourselves to the world. Um, we're, we're we're terrible, and and are very poorly misunderstood. A lot of people resist economic thinking because they think 
that's been asked them to adopt the values of economists. And they think economists just value stock market wealth or, or GDP or something. And then, and that they don't want to be like that. So they don't want to embrace the economics because it's, they think it's about values, not about the decision-making process. Um, and, and, and the other thing that people think we are is forecasters and we're not forecasters. Um, we are, um, you know, one part decision-making science, one part dog owner. I mean, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, I'll let you and your, your friend close this out, but I guess, uh, what do you see I guess, as, the, as the limitations of economics as sort of a, a lens to assessing policymaking? Well, look, I think that the limitations are kind of go back to what I started with at the beginning, which is that these systems for defining market exchange work less and less well when you try to push them into areas that are about dealing with our nearest and dearest. And I think, you know, Ayn Rand is actually a great example of this. <laughs> this is Sybil. Hi, Sybil. Um, <laughs> Sybil, I know you love economics too, honey. Um, she just actually, you know, she devoured uh, your, your book. Um, <laughs> <she> really <laughs> loved it <laughs> uh, from front to back. Um, no, I, I think that the limitation is that you can get to the point where you start thinking transactionally, like with other human beings with, with your wife, with your spouses. And this is like, if you read Ayn Rand's books, this is basically the fundamental problem is that she kind of assumes that everyone is treating every interaction with every person they meet as market exchange. And that's actually not at all how we work. And in, in, in her personal life, she tried to apply those principles and they failed. And I think that, that that's actually where economics has its greatest limitations is when we forget to account for the ways that, you know, Tyler Cowen says this, like don't pay your kids to do the dishes because then you're setting up, right? You're breaking the fundamental logic of a family which is just different from the market. And so I think that that is where economists can sometimes go wrong is just by failing to bring enough of those areas in. And then sometimes by being a little arrogant, the, the good thing about economics is that it's better, it's subject matter is often better specified than sociology or political science just in that, you have a unit of account, right? You can see money and it's easier to track than like power or like friendship, right? Um, and so because they have a better unit of account because it's somewhat more precise, they then think that they have all of the insights and the other sides are just being fuzzy and don't and, and are kind of pseudoscience. And that's false. There's a lot of insights to be gained from these other fields, but they're harder they're harder to test, they're harder to translate because so much of it relies on setting up an index that measures something. And then you ask, well, how reliable is the index? Whereas money is something we can all, I mean, it's actually more complicated when you dig down into it, but it's something we can kind of at least basically agree on in a way that is much harder to do in other fields. And instead of kind of having mad respect for the fact that those other fields are doing something more difficult, um, they, they, they sort of say, well, they're, they're not really doing anything at all. And then on the other side, you get kind of physics envy where like all they want to do is math because math is pure and it, it, it's precise. And then you can precisely specify nothing at all, nothing of, of any value. Um, and that is also a flaw that, that economists kind of fall into. No, I think, I think those are great points. I think it's, um, I would characterize it as, I think sometimes there's a, um, an over broadening of maybe those philosophical underpinnings um, but also getting a little narrow in terms of what you study based on what you can quantify or what you, you know, you, you, you may shy away from studying as rigorously some things that are more difficult to, to quantify because it doesn't fit as well with the tools in the, in the economist toolkit. So um, I, yeah, I think those are, I think those are great points. Um, we are at the end of our time. Uh, so I, I, first of all, I want to say thank you again to, to, to Stephen and to Doug and to uh, to Megan for being with us today. I think this has been a great conversation and a lot of fantastic insights. Um, I want to thank all of our all of our viewers as well. Uh, really appreciate you being with us and asking questions and uh, uh, look forward to uh, to doing another event with you all soon. So uh, thank you again so much and uh, have a great have a great rest of your day. Thank you. And I want to apologize for my dog's behavior. Oh, <laughs> I only I only apologize for not extending an invitation to Sybil to participate in the conversation. So. <laughs> Just a lot of that. I have reasons to like that dog because she'll have to buy another copy. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, actually, I bought it on Kindle. So you 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 got less, or I think your publisher got somewhat less money for yeah, me right. on the second. Well, when you said devoured, that's good to know because now it makes it a little less likely that the, the book itself was physically devoured. So uh, she's no, she, no, I bought it again on Kindle because ah, she the physical. This is uh, she's a very <laughs> elevated. She loves the New Yorker. Really, lo especially loves the New Yorker. Um, but yeah, she has she loves a lot of great books. Oh, great. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Have a great, have a great rest, a great day and a great rest of your week. Thank you, Jonathan. You did a great job. Thank you. Thanks.